Okay, perfect. It looks like um, we have just about everybody who had signed up. We might have a couple stragglers come in. Hey, everybody. My name is Philip Macko, um, and uh, I'm very, very excited to talk to all of you. Uh, as you probably have seen, I'm the author of Think Your Age, Don't Act It, and co-author of a book called Make Others Greater. Um, we're going to talk so much about uh, both of them over the course of uh, the next 30 minutes. And uh, listen, I know, you know, thank you for taking time out of your schedule because I know how busy schedules can be. I promise to make the time worthwhile. Um, but in exchange for me doing my job, I'm going to ask something of you as well. Um, I would mentioned the presentation is going to be about 30 minutes, um, but I'm going to ask you just to commit to at least the first 15. And... Um, you know, give yourself that gift of time and listen, you'll know in the first 15 minutes if this presentation is really resonating with you, if uh, the things we're talking about are, are, are helpful to you, and I'm confident they will be. Um, and if you make it through the first 15 and you like what you've heard, then absolutely please stay for the remainder of the 15 because we've got some cool offers and some other things. Um, you know, and we're going to talk about a bunch, uh, the myth of multitasking debunked and, you know, all the things you see on this list. But the reason I ask you to just put everything aside for a moment, you know, put down the cell phone and, and you know, shut off the email and everything else for the next 15 is multitasking just doesn't work. And you're not going to get what you could get from this presentation if you're semi-tuned in. Um, one of my favorite authors is John Medina. And if you haven't read the book, uh, I highly recommend the book Brain Rules. And uh, of the many th amazing things that he talks about uh, he debunks the myth of multitasking and he simply says as you see in that first paragraph up here multitasking when it comes to paying attention is a myth um, he's proven through MRI studies that while we think that we are reading an email while we're listening in fact the brain is sending individual signals uh, when you know when we grab the smartphone to check a text the brain shuts off the listening engages the text reading and gives a new set of commands and then we put the phone back down you know we go back to the command that says uh, listen to the presentation again and as you can see in the bottom right here as much as 300 uh, percent increase in errors occur when we do this thing that we all you know <laughs> including myself I used to think that I was pretty darn good at it but the reality is you, you, you can't and we're not good. Um, uh, you know, even studies are now showing that the, the perils of multitasking are, and, and I apologize, it's a little grainy, but it says people who multitask feel like they're accomplishing more, but they're actually cutting down their own productivity. Um, studies have shown an increase, uh, 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 an increase in error rate as high as 15% and lost productivity as high as 25 to 30 percent and this is driven by the mistakes the miscommunications the many times back through the same thing to get it fixed it's all those things combined so hey um this is why i'm asking you know don't worry about that facebook <laughs> status pop-up i know it's hard i do the same thing you know put down the cell phones uh, um, because you know I, I i really want this time to be valuable and so um, you've probably heard of it, but in case you haven't, uh, Dr. Albert Morabian did some groundbreaking work that's become, uh, you know, just worldwide uh, renowned in terms of uh, effective communication. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, the uh, young lady at the bottom right, that's how a lot of us look. And the reason why is this. So we, we get about 7% of the uh, conversations actual meaning from the words that are said so if you're listening to me right now but you're looking at your screen or reading a piece of paper or, you know whatever the other multitasking things you might do you're gonna retain about seven percent of what we talk about and that's you know that would be a shame um, I think you owe yourself more <laughs> an additional 38 percent comes from uh, voice voice inflection tone the way the way things are said um, so yeah, if you're focused and, and you know not doing other things, we, we we've got you now to 45 percent. The remaining 55, you know, I'm sorry, I can't can't do anything about the body language. But if you're engaged right now, 
uh, I'll do this. I'll do this in exchange. There, there are some techniques I know that you know can make up some of that 55% gap. But uh, listen, this is why I ask because it, you know, it is important. And then the last thing before um, we get uh, done with our section of debunking the myth of multitasking. So we speak. Um, wow, I actually spelled that word wrong. <laughs> It's so sorry, everybody. I think it's S P E A K, isn't it? Uh, and I'm an author, so shame on me. <laughs> um, uh, we speak at uh, 250 words per minute. We listen and think at 500 plus. So the other thing that you have to do, and this is true not only in this presentation, but this is in day-to-day -day communications. If you're a salesperson, this is in talking to your client. Uh, you know, your manager, the people you manage, um, we have to be engaged listeners because when we're not and we let a thought roll into our mind, our mind spins off at twice the speed of the person talking to us. So you can imagine how many disconnects can occur and how quickly they can occur if we're not careful and we're not tuned into what we see in front of us. So, you know, I'm telling you all this to argue that, you know, I, I want you to spend that 15 minutes with me, but hopefully as well, you know, these are takeaways into your, in your work day and in your home life tonight that um, maybe you never thought of or saw, and, you know, maybe they'll, they'll help you along the way as well, I, I, I hope. Um, so, listen, before we dig in, um, I'm not a big fan of reading verbatim, word for word, uh, bullet points from a presentation, but... Uh, if you would please just read the, the, the three here, and uh, if you can answer yes to one or more of them, then this is uh, going to be a good presentation for you. Um, as you're doing that, by the way, there is a chat window. Um, feel free to pop some things in there, um, certainly if you have some questions. I'll, tr I'll try, uh, in the essence of time, I may not get to all the questions. I'll, I'll certainly give it my best run. Um, but, you know, if you send me your email address in, in one of the pop-ups at the end of the presentation or even in the chat window, more than happy to email you directly. Um, so, wow, fantastic. We didn't lose anybody. Um, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned in the onset, um, yeah, I'm... I'm uh, very proud to have been, been involved in, uh, uh, first of all, my, uh, you know, of course, writing my first book, which was Think Your Age, Don't Act It. And this was really driven by my life experience. Um, uh, to tell you a little bit quickly about myself, um, I, uh, I've recreated my career, you know, four times, going on the fifth being a published author. Um, and this is due to everything from personal choices I've made to corporate downsizing, you know, and... Um, if you haven't had, you know, to make a career change or a career move or had something unexpected happen or decided you wanted to cre recreate yourself, I'm relatively sure that someone around you, a loved one or, you know, relative, some uh, friend, something like that has been through it. So this is why I wrote this book. It was really about, you know, career recreation, uh, self-recreation. Um, and, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, midway through the presentation about what personal recreation kind of life lessons that you know I'm sharing in the book about things that I've been through so that's about that one um, make others greater is just a phenomenally engaging story uh, it it centers itself around the real-life experiences of one of my heroes and one of my dear and closest friends uh, Gary Geller and uh, Gary uh, in 2003 um, set two Mount Everest based records. Uh, he's gone on since to do uh, a lot more amazing things than uh, beyond, above and beyond Everest. But uh, uh, so the book is about Gary's experience. We'll get in some detail about that in, in a few minutes too. Um, and then of course uh, the uh, Everest expedition, which we'll talk about, uh, became a DVD as well. So Team Everest, a Himalayan journey. I'm going to tell you it's probably the most inspiring movie I've ever seen and uh, you know I'm I like to think I'm a rough tough guy I had to have a box of Kleenex the first time I watched it not because it's sad just because it's so beautifully moving and, and powerful so uh, those are the three things we're going to talk about but uh, 
Look, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this conversation, right? Because I've got about five minutes left on the promise that I made you make to me. Um, <laughs> uh, sustainable change is, is, is achieved incrementally. I'm breaking my own rule. Take small steps, they add up. This is, uh, this is part number one of, of three sections I pulled directly from the first book. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, percent of Americans who usually make New Year's resolutions, 45%. Uh, and I probably think this holds true for all countries. Uh, let's assume that it does for the sake of this conversation. And those who infrequently, another 17%. So you got 62% who make resolutions. Um, and by the way, New, New Year's resolutions, which is what we're talking about, are nothing other than goals. Uh, you know, they're just goals that happen on a certain calendar day, uh, but they're still goals. It's still achieving a resolution is very much the same process as pursuing a goal. Um, so you got 62% of Americans uh, who set goals, um, but uh, what's this all about? <laughs> 8%, according to this study, are successful. You know, I've never met anybody. I don't think I've ever met anybody that when I said, you know, what, wh how, what kind of improvements do you want in your life? Do you want your life to get better? And if so, what do you want to do? And I've never had them say, yeah, actually, I just want everything to kind of stink and I want to fail and, you know, I want it to get worse and all that. Never happened, right? So I, I don't even understand these numbers. If 62% of us set resolutions, what's driving the fail rate? That's just totally unacceptable uh, to me. You know, uh, and it, so it, it's interesting as a side note, um, look at the resolutions, the top 10, uh, with the exception of quitting smoking, there's, there, you know, and this is a, a side note conversation, but they're all very general. Like, what does getting organized mean? What does that look like? What would I be doing differently and seeing differently if I became suddenly organized? Uh, you know, part of the problem with uh, one of the many things in this equation is the specificity. You know, uh, those of you in business, I'm sure you've heard the acronym specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic, time bound, smart goals. Uh, doesn't look like any of these really are those. Uh, so, just as a quick aside, um, here is a study that I actually cited in, in, in my first book. And um, what really struck me about this is 78% um, fail rate. So 22%, it's a little bit better than the other study, 22% uh, were successful in their goal setting. <laughs> but the 78% that failed, they failed because they were focused on the downside of not achieving their goal rather than the upside of actually doing it. And, um, you know, this was a fairly extensive study of like 700 people. Um, uh, and... Here's the thing, and I, I don't know, I guess it's human nature. We, um, we tend to see the gap is what I call it. We tend to see where we are and where we want to be, and we just measure ourselves against that goal we're trying to achieve as if we could get there tomorrow. You know, like, and I'll use myself as an example. Um, yeah, I usually range around 190 pounds. For some reason, travel all these things combined, I ended up around 205. So obviously my goal was to get back to 190. And if I were to do like this study says, I would just get up every day, look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm so overweight. This is terrible. I'm 15 pounds. Uh, you know, you can't do that. That doesn't work, right? You can't, you can't focus on your financial goals and say, I'm so broke. I'm nowhere near where I'm trying to get to. That's not going to get you there. Um, here's what does get you there. And Man, I've got to talk fast. We're coming up on 14 minutes, so I'm going to really try to get through at least point one. Um, here, if we do the, just the first three things on this list, we can increase our percentage of success from 22% all the way up to 50. So number one is you set smaller subset goals. Um, and what does that look like? Uh, well, let's say you you want to exercise five days a week and you're currently only exercising five times a month, right? So you could set that goal and say, I'm going to exercise five times a week. Um, but you know what? Your body needs to get used to it and you're going to go through some soreness and some pain along the way. It's very smart to set a smaller subset goal. So it might look like this. In the first three weeks, you might say, I'm going to exercise two times a week 
and I'm going to go for a walk two times a week. So I've got four days total, not five, and two of the days are lesser cardio impactive kinds of days, right? And now, why do I say 21 days or three weeks? Uh, you know, studies have conclusively shown over the years it takes 21 days to form a habit. So set smaller subset goals. Keep that 21-day range in mind. And if you set goals you can reach across the three-week increments, reward yourself at the end of the three weeks. You know, do something, whether it could be a bottle of wine or going to a movie. It doesn't have to be elaborate. But set small subset goals and reward yourself when you hit them. Um, enlist the support of others. Uh, so, you know, I do, uh, man, it's an aggressive, uh, it's called Tap Out XT. It's like a 90 day extreme program. And um, it's tough. Uh, I'm not going to lie, but I love it. Uh, six days a week. Um, and two of my best friends are, are doing the program right with me. And we all email each other or text each other every day uh, and check in and say, hey, we did our workout. And now why is this important? Um, certainly you've got accountability. That's kind of the no-brainer of this. More importantly, you've got support. And, you know, on those days when it's tough, man, your legs hurt or you just did an international trip and you come home and you're jet lagged, you've got somebody in your corner cheering for you. Uh, but really super important. Uh, the next one to get you to the 50%, um, keep a diary of your progress. Uh, so why is that important? Um, the diary is your accountability to yourself. You know, yeah, it's awesome that you can look back on the journey and, you know, see what you went through to get to where you are today. But if you have to sit down every day and account to yourself what's going on, and how you're getting towards your goal. If you have to do that, then there has to be something to write. I mean, you can't sit down and say, I blew it, I ate a bunch of cupcakes, <laughs> I'm not losing weight today. You know, that's not going to make you happy to write. So it is personal accountability. And you do those first three things, uh, studies have shown you're going to get yourself up to a 50%. So we've more than doubled our, our goal success rate. We can do better. Um, I've been very, very fascinated by the uh, work of Dr. Martin Seligman. And uh, Seligman is uh, really the pioneer in the field of positive psychology. Uh, I cite quite a bit of his work in both of my books, actually, because, uh, you know, rather than addressing the pathology, um, Seligman has found a way to support and enhance the positivity of things. And uh, along the way, though, he learned some things about human nature that are particularly relevant to our conversation. Um, and the first is learned helplessness. So what that means is, in, uh, hey, I apologize to all you animal lovers on, on uh, attending the presentation. Before I tell you the story, I will tell you that no animals were harmed in this uh, experiment. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, Seligman took uh, uh, about a dozen small animals and put them into a cage. Uh, the cage had two exits. Both exits were locked. Um, the, the animal was coaxed to try to escape the cage, and uh, for several days they tried and were unsuccessful. And what he found is that after several days of trying, the animal just stopped trying to escape. Um, even if they were prodded, they just wouldn't go to the exits. Seligman then unlocked the exits. Nothing changed. So what happened is the animal was taught that they couldn't do something, they couldn't accomplish something, and they just gave up trying forever. The gates were open. All they would have had to do is push, and they would have escaped the cage and been free again, but they just stopped trying. And what's interesting about this study is Seligman found that people do the very same thing. So you know, as you're looking back across your goals, uh, do realize that if you, uh, you know, and, and be careful about the learned helplessness component, but realize that you're a different person today than you were even yesterday. And if, you know, if you tried something in the past and weren't successful at it, perhaps it's because you needed some life experience to help drive your success. And don't be afraid to come back at that again today. Don't allow learned helplessness to be a factor in, in keeping you from achieving the things that you want to do in your life. Um, and then finally, Seligman recognized that our society rewards, um, <laughs> the, I don't know how else to say it, the cynic, you know. We, uh, we bestow an intellectual coolness on uh, cynicism, you know, and uh, 
um, I don't know, you watch cable TV and, you know, the reality shows and it's all being critical of, you know, a political figure, you know, uh, uh, entertainment person. Uh, certainly a few come to mind. And, you know, you got Simon Cowell and, you know, he was everybody's favorite grump, right? And so society looks at these people who are so critical and they say, well, oh, you know, they're the intelligent ones. And that's just crap. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, do not allow the entrenched cynicism of the world to affect the goal, the thing that you want to do in your life. Sort it out, you know. Uh, learn helplessness and entrenched cynicism. These are two really key things that we go into some great detail on, on uh, in the book. And then finally, um, whether it's a New Year's resolution or a goal, I, I really want to drive this point home because it's an important thing to, to, to have in the back of your mind. And let's take the resolution because it's an easy one to visualize. So we write down things the last week of December and then when the calendar flips to January 1st, we're going to start doing those things, right? I'm going to exercise five times a week. I'm going to take my kids on more vacations. I'm going to eat better. Uh, I'm going to be nicer to my husband or wife, you know, all these things, right? And we bestow this, like, magic quality to the turn of a page you know it just it's just another day and now instead of December 31st the calendar says January 1st and all of a sudden we think we're gonna wake up different people like I'm now Superman or Superwoman and I can do the things that I could never do last year because the calendar changed I mean that's craziness and so when you think about a goal you gotta really understand that you're gonna be the same person tomorrow that you were today so focus on incremental growth don't go after the big thing out of the gate, you know. Grow your way into it because along the way there is, uh, you know, the environment has to support you. Your friends and family have to buy into it. You yourself have to grow into the role of whatever it is you're trying to do. And you don't just do that waking up tomorrow and starting. So when you set realistic goals in the manner we've talked about, hey, you can get yourself up to a 75% sex, uh, <laughs> sex rate. Well, that was a slip. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry about that, everybody. Success rate. Um, you know, talking about learned helplessness, um, tell you a little bit more about uh, myself and, and my good friend. Um, so I'm that funny looking guy in the black t-shirt on the left in, in the picture right here. And if you take a look at my left hand, um, you can see that I'm, uh, well, maybe you can't, but now I'm pointing it out, you'll see it. I'm missing a finger. Um, and uh, so 19 years ago, uh, I, um, you know, amputated two of my fingers, um, uh, and it was a traumatic amputation. I was had a life flight to uh, the hospital, 18 hours of microsurgery, two blood transfusions, and you know, nearly dying. And um, they managed to save one finger, and it became a giant Franken finger. Um, from that day on, I left the hospital with pain medication, and as you can imagine. You know, they had the microsurgery on my nerves. Uh, the thing hurt, and it still hurts. But for the next 18 years, I had a relationship with prescription narcotics. Uh, it just became a way of life. And then one day I decided I was going to try life without it. Um, and, and I went into that weekend thinking I was going to go through cold sweats and, you know, sneak out at night and rob a pharmacy. And so I stocked up on food and a bunch of video games, locked myself at home, and the crazy thing was, all I did was eat good food and play video games. And that was more than two years ago. Uh, it was such an incredible blessing to my life. My head is more clear. My, my focus is 10 times what it was. And uh, I've been able to do some things that I've always wanted to do in my life. So when we talk about personal reinvention, uh, hey, I've been through some things. And if what I've learned can help you, that's really why I wrote both of the books that I did. Now that handsome fella sitting next to me, um, this guy right here holding up, that's version one of the Think Your Age book, by the way. Uh, we have a new copy coming out um, that uh, we'll talk about. Um, so Gary, uh, I think it was in 1996, um, he and two friends were climbing Pico de Orizaba in Mexico, and uh, there was a slip in the ice, and, and the team fell, and you know they all ended up at the base, and you know, laying there, uh, unable to move. Uh, they went into the night just, you know, not knowing how the morning would be for them. And uh, when Gary woke up, his best friend laying next to him had, had passed away. And, you know, so Gary laid there recognizing that um, he couldn't move his left arm. And, 
you know, he couldn't move his body and he had numbness all over. And it was an additional two days before the rescue teams came. Um, three years later, Gary realized that his left arm was never going to come back and, and participate with him again. So he made the decision to um, have that uh, have that arm amputated, if you can imagine. Um, and from that point, he's gone on to become the first man in history missing an arm to, to summit Mount Everest. And Gary led the largest team of persons with disabilities to ever make base camp of Mount Everest. And that's the documentary that I showed you pictures of. Um, we're talking about persons with uh, quadriplegia and persons with uh, paraplegia and, and people who've had their legs amputated and obviously their arms amputated. And all these people did it, man. It, only 30% of the uh, quote-unquote able-bodied folks that try to get to base camp actually get there, got there. And I think it was 12 out of 15 people in the group Gary led made it. And, you know, Gary went on to summit. But you know what? Gary tried Everest two years before, and he didn't make it. And the learned helplessness didn't stop him from trying again. And, you know, thank, thank, uh, thank God, thank the universe, thank whoever you want to that uh, he persisted beyond that. Uh, the picture to the right says that's just uh, Gary and I both had our first experience uh, thank to, thanks to uh, my best buddy Loop. Um, we went skydiving together and you know that's the picture and that's another story for another time. Um, so uh, lesson number two which is numbered number three because I took it out of the book um, and I'm gonna have to talk fast to make the 30 minute mark. Um, we may just you know run a, a minute or two over. I apologize for that but uh, it says the next time you face a challenge, don't just grab the cube and start twisting. And Here's what I mean by that. Um, in the book, I make the analogy that life is very much like a, a Rubik's Cube. Um, the number you see above the picture of the Rubik's Cube, that's uh, Google's supercomputer has determined that that's how many possible moves there are on that cube. And that's a lot like life, isn't it? I mean, look at all the possible things we can do right and wrong and, uh, you know, each move we make, like the twist of the cube, puts us closer to our goal or, uh, you know, we, we tread in place or, or we, we twist in the wind. You know, we, we, you can make one of these 43 kabillion gazillion, whatever that number is, <laughs> uh, you can make that many moves. Um, so I, I say to you in the book, and I'll say to you now, be more like Eric than Graham. <laughs> uh, Eric in the, in the bottom left here. Um, you know, 7.08 seconds he solved the cube. Uh, Google supercomputers again estimate that it takes uh, 20 moves. Graham Parker of England worked on this cube for 26 years. And think about that. That's a lot like life. You know, some people just move forward and other people just keep, you know, uh, I, I, it's called repetitive compulsion. Um, it's the, the need to get back to familiarity, to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. And, you know, what I suggest to you, whoops, what I suggest to you is this. There's experts out there. There's people that have been through what you're trying to do. Um, certainly Gary and I, from uh, many perspectives, can be a uh, go-to source for you. Go find the right 20 moves, just like the cube. Go find the right moves before you take action. Otherwise, you, there's so much possible risk of making mistakes and, you know, falling into repetitive compulsions, uh, compulsion. So that's lesson number two. And ah, number three, let results be the measure of your success. Um, <laughs> so what's better than sex? It could be talking about yourself. Uh, um, uh, MRI studies have now shown that... Um, you know, uh, first of all, uh, researchers estimate we spend about 40% of our communications talking about ourselves. And the act of talking about ourselves triggers uh, the, the pleasure centers in the brain, the dopamine-releasing pleasure centers, in the same way that food and money and, yes, sex do. Uh, so it's a very appealing thing to, uh, you know, because of the brain center reward to talk about ourselves. But listen... Um, you don't achieve goals all by yourself. Even the Lone Ranger wasn't really alone. He, <laughs> he had Tonto with him, right? Um, Gary would have never, ever made this tremendous accomplishment and went on to summit were it not for all the people that were involved in helping make this happen. And to, 
to get the buy-in from others and to help others achieve what they what they want is really what's going to help you achieve what you want in your life. And it's like the everybody on the boat and the water rises and everybody goes up together. Um, but here's a great example. You know, Gary's up here in the <clears throat> in the top left. And he's not standing front and center. He's the guy that led the team, right? But that's very much his way. He, this was about the other people uh, and their experience and helping, yeah, quote, unquote, make others greater. Um, in the documentary, and if you get the chance to see it, um, and I highly recommend it, you'll find that Gary's summiting of Mount Everest is just a small byline at the end of the movie. Um, so stay humble. Be more attentive to what um, to, to those around you than, than really... Um, uh, you, you know yourself and, and what you want to talk about with yourself and what you'll find is that by doing so uh, people buy into um, you know supporting you and, and driving the things that you want as well so hey we're at the 30 minute mark 30 minutes and 30 seconds so um, I promise you that uh, uh, actually we don't have time for questions I've got a couple offers for you so I want to run through those really quickly and um, if you like the presentation and you're interested in, uh, you know, learning a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the, the Everest experience and in Make Others Greater, you know, we talk about leaders from around the world and throughout history. And we, you know, take Gary's amazing story and Sir Ernest Shackleton's story and we contrast it with uh, uh, Sir Robert Scott and his, uh, um, the, the, Terra Nova expedition where, you know, in that case, every single person that, that went uh, died because of the decisions that were made versus Shackleton, who two years stranded in the Arctic and brought every single crew member home. And, you know, what were the differences? So there's just some amazing stories in, in Make Others Greater as there are in Think Your Age. So here's, uh, we've got three offers for you really quick, and I promise we're wrapping up towards the end. If you purchase either of my books and you email me your receipt, um, here's what I'm going to do. The first 10 people to do that from this webinar, um, I'll send you a free digital copy via email. Uh, it'll be in the uh, Amazon Kindle format. Um, three second prize winners, I'll send you autographed personalized copies of both books. And uh, Gary and I will sign Make Others Greater, and certainly I'll sign Think Your Age um, at no additional cost. And then grand prize is... You're going to get the personalized books. Uh, I'll also send you a complimentary copy of the documentary Team Everest, A Himalayan Journey. And uh, if you're interested, I'll schedule some time with you. Let's take an hour together and do a video chat, and let's talk about some of the things you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, And in, in doing so, um, maybe we can put some plans together that will help you. So um, uh, disregard this. Uh, what I do want to say is that all prizes will be awarded within two weeks of your um, um, attending the webinar. So uh, keep that in mind. And this is offer number one. And uh, give you a couple more seconds uh, to, to click that if that should be of interest to you. Um, and here's offer number two. So we'll keep up that first offer for just a moment. Um, if you'd like to um, um, have any one of these books, whoops. Um, so if you'd like to have any one of these books, here's the, the price that they are all by themselves. Um, uh, if you buy direct from me, and uh, this would be via PayPal to my uh, fill at secondstarters.com address. We'll pop that up in the window. Um, think your age. I'll send it to you autographed uh, for $6.99 versus the Amazon $7.99 price. Um, the documentary, if you'd like a copy of that, um, normally $19.99 online. Now, the copies I have don't have the plastic sleeve, but uh, if you'd like that documentary, our, our uh, incentive for attending today's presentation is uh, $14.95. Um, and then uh, th uh, uh, Make Others Greater, uh, if you were to buy that from Amazon, uh, $14.99. And in today's webinar and presentation, uh, if you're interested, um, purchase direct from me at $12.99, and we'll send them, again, an autographed copy. You're welcome to get, you know, mix and match one or two of these. Uh, if you do have interest in buying all three, uh, normally it would be $42.93 online, and we've bundled it together to be $33.95 uh, plus $5 shipping. Um, it, it, any of the individual ones you might purchase, please add $2.99, and you'll see that in the pop-up window, and then... Uh, if you like the entire bundle, autograph, DVD, everything else, 
I will tell you it's fantastic and it's it's just an honor uh, to have been a part of these projects um, I, I promise you'll enjoy so we are getting right at the end of the presentation um, and I just want to simply say from the bottom of my heart thank you thank you so much for taking your time and you know I, I hope that you'll join uh, myself or Gary or both of us in future presentations we'll certainly let you know thanks everybody have a great day